Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. Justin Carbonell and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hey guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I welcome back Andy Constant of Damp Spring, a macroeconomic research firm to talk all things macro. Andy discusses how he's left the higher for a longer island but doesn't yet know where he's going to land. He talks through the reasons for the changed outlook and the various economic forces, inflation, the Fed, the bond market, that may impact his final decision and destination. We wrap up talking through his views on alpha, beta, and how he constructs portfolios to generate long-term returns. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Damp Springs and Andy Constant. And just one more thing before we start. We're very excited to announce our first ever charity podcast day in conjunction with our friends at Spot Gamma. On April 30th, we will host an all-day live broadcast on our YouTube channel to benefit the Susan G. Komen Foundation. We will interview 24 guests from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. The guests will include many of the most popular guests we've had in the podcast, plus many other experts from the investing macro and options worlds. Our guest today, Andy Constant, will be kicking off a live stream with us as our first guest at 8 a.m. To be notified when we go live, go to the Excess Returns channel on YouTube, click on the live link, and then click on Notify Me under the PNL for a purpose image. We hope you'll join us on the 30th to support what is a great cause. Thank you so much. Andy, how are you? Thank you for coming back and joining us again. I'm great, Justin. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Our audience always loves to uh, hear your thoughts on the macro landscape, what you're thinking. I think it'd be implications for uh, investors and just people in general and sort of, you know, where you're, where, where you're at and how you're actually informing um, your subscribers um, with the research that you put out. But I think it would be good to start with sort of how you think about sort of the macro framework or landscape and this concept of islands that you often uh, discuss on Twitter. Sure. It's become a meme. Um, so the way I look at um, the potential paths of the, uh, of the economy is one in which we're uncertain about growth, we're uncertain about inflation, and the Fed is working in its way, as well as economic conditions just playing out, like supply chains getting resolved, et cetera, to try to um, achieve a low inflation back down to target uh, without significant job losses and without damaging the economy in any meaningful way. So not have, you know, getting to basically to trend growth and target inflation, which, you know, is roughly one and a half percent growth, real growth and their 2% inflation target. And so to achieve that one does what they, the Fed has been doing and then follows the data and shifts their, um, uses their tools how they do to achieve that outcome. And so that's called a soft landing. And it would be ideal for the, for the world, for the United States, for its citizens, for its, all, you know, the widest range of, the, of its participants to have all those things occur. And so that's the direction that the Fed is trying to pilot to, the island that they're trying to pilot to. Um, now, about... God, it's between 18 and 24 months ago when I came up with this idea. Um, there was, um, actually, it was July of 22, I think, when the first hike was done about a month earlier. But there was a sort of a panic hike in, there was a small hike in May, and then there was a panic hike in June, um, and then a July hike. And, you know, Rates had gone from 25 basis points to 150 basis points uh, in three meetings. And so right at that point in time, uh, people believed that and had begun pricing in the idea that the rate path was not going to be that steep and that the Fed was going to actually cause a, uh, a recession. Um, and then and so that is typically what happens in a rate hike cycle is you're trying to curtail demand um, so that the economy will slow down and you do it by increasing the cost of money, having the yield curve, um, long-term bond yields go up. And 
what that typically does is slow the economy down. And because the tools are rough, um, either they have to keep pressing on the brakes or, and then sort of have an accident because they press too hard. Maybe somebody rear ends them or they have to let off a little bit and then inflation and growth kick back in. And so then, then they have to tap the brakes again. So that's normally the path to the soft landing. Um, and at the time, you know, everyone expected an imminent recession and pretty much I was alone in saying, you know, this supply chain thing is great. We all know that the supply chain is going to improve. It was in fact transitory for the reasons that they called it transitory because supply chains resolve eventually. You're even seeing that today in the Panama Canal being closed or, you know, significantly curtailed and the Red Sea having its issues with the Houthis. Um, I think I pronounced that right. Um, and all of those things get resolved. Either the costs goes up or ultimately the supply chain calms down. Um, and so I expected that, but at the same time, I expected significant growth, real growth in the economy. Uh, I thought monetary conditions remained extremely easy and that we weren't going to have a recession. In fact, it was going to be higher or for longer. And so I coined that higher for longer is a common term. I called, coined the second thing and then made an island about it. And what happens on that island is real growth ends up being a well above trend for a, a long time. Inflation ends up being above, uh, f falling less rapidly to target than desired. And so the Fed has to have interest, keep interest rates high for long. Um, and that's pretty much played out. Um, and everyone, there are some perma bears that continue to forecast doom, recessions, et cetera. But perma bear, uh, but besides those types, the sort of normal players in markets have gotten all, all, um, off of recession island and have now drifted over to either a soft landing or higher for longer. And so there's really, it's really empty on recession island right now. There's nobody short um, uh, equities, nobody short uh, corporate bonds, credit spreads are tight, equity vol is low. Uh, and most importantly, um, what is priced in in terms of future cuts in interest rates is no longer a rapid, rapid cut cycle, but a cycle that is more consistent with what the Fed has been saying that their cut, cut, um, their, their cut cycle is going to look like. And so at this stage, I consider a soft landing still is possible, but really what people are now expecting is that growth will continue to do very well um, for, uh, with, and we will completely avoid a recession. Um, and at the same time, people expect inflation to, rem, um, to, uh, return to target. And to me, that is, uh, now become my view has now become consensus. So I've left. So you've left the higher for longer Island Yeah. and where, where are you, do you think you're headed? Well, there's really, um, for one, there's a possibility that I'm wrong and that in fact, inflation does escalate. I just expect <clears throat> it to be sticky. Um, I don't expect it to ramp back up for any reason. It could, but that's not my expectation. I'll be back at higher for longer Island if uh, that happens. But what I think, and for that matter, I'll be back if the Fed cuts rapidly, but I don't think that's likely either. Um, and so where I'm headed is either something that kills inflation. And it could be that it's a soft landing or it could be a recession of some sort. And so what I've, what I've described today um, is that I'm in the uh, economic slowdown C and I'm lashed to the, um, the, the mast of my boat <laughs> with my crew with wax in their ears as we pass the sirens on soft landing island. And I'm doing everything I can to not land on soft landing island because I just think it's very unlikely. Now, what typically would happen is I'll end up at recession island, but I don't know yet. So that's why I'm out there. I do know that it's very unlikely that we'll end up soft landing island, but most importantly, 
pricing has no recession in it whatsoever and high degree of, and 50, 50, look, call it whatever it is of soft landing or, you know, higher for longer, um, sort of no landing. Um, and so for me, when I'm thinking about trading markets and I'm looking at what's priced in, uh, what's priced in is some, is very low odds of a recession and quite frankly, recessions happen frequently and certainly can happen when you have so much, um, so such heavy winds going in so many directions, um, from central bankers, from the globe, from geopolitics, from fiscal, and then we have an election coming. There's just, you know, with lots of wins. And so landing this plane softly is going to be a hell of a thing. And so I'm trying to avoid landing there. Well, and, you're, but, and you're not paid to land there either. I, I, I think we're flying and sailing, but if you do need to be rescued, Jack, Jack is a sailor, so he can, he can come out and get you. I, I actually knew that for some reason. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think Why? we talked about another podcast. I think you're a power yeah. boater, right? You're not a sailor. <laughs> uh, a wakeboarder, yeah. Yeah, okay. So you'll get to whatever island a lot faster than I will, uh, <laughs> depending on where you're going. I just had um, to the engine on my boat, unfortunately. It's oh, a no. Lot. That's a Yeah, I know. That, that could be a major, major deal. Yep. Um, I want to ask you about the Fed cuts, because you mentioned the more cuts were priced in than the Fed was indicating for a really long time. That's changed recently. Well, what do you think the Fed is going to do here going forward? I mean, do you think we potentially get a cut in June and a few cuts this year? Or how do you think it might play out? It's going to be data dependent. Uh, you know, it's a cop out. But, you know, again, I think that what we had in, well, what we had in September and October was a significant tightening of financial conditions. And that was because both stocks fell and interest rates, long term interest rates rose to over 5%. Um, and so we had a, a fairly um, tight environment for a couple of months. And what that did is it led to um, a, um, economic slowdown in November, December, and maybe a little bit in January data, all the data that was released in January for, for December, certainly. And so inflation expectations came in, the Fed pivoted in December, uh, markets priced seven cuts in December. Each of those things um, was a big easing. And then financial markets took off in the first quarter. And so I think the environment is such that you're going to see warmer economy, warmer inflation, which would indicate that they're not going to cut in June. Um, but I don't know. I'm not making a bet on that per se. Do you think is I'm just thinking about what they should do. And, and I have friends who kind of go both the people I follow who kind of go both directions on this. Some people say, you know, things are really strong right now. There, there's no reason the Fed should even be discussing cutting at this point. There's, there's just no point in that. And then other people would say, the Fed, you know, I don't know what the neutral rate is kind of this nebulous concept, but whatever it is, they're probably significantly above it right now. And if, if they want to stick the soft landing, they're going to want to incrementally get down there. So by cutting now, they'll still be significantly tight, but they'll be working their way down as inflation cools. I'm just wondering, like, what do you think about those two arguments? Wh which one I do think, you think makes think more sense? I think they're both valid, but I also think they are um, not the point in our current economy. And the reason why I say that is I don't think the short rate is having much impact on the economy. I think what has impact on the econ economy is where uh, long-term borrowers um, are able to finance. And so I saw today the 30-year um, mortgage is now at, uh, I think it was 688 um, yield. Um, and that's not tight. 688 is an, is a, it's not great. Let me tell you, it's not like 3% or 2%, but it's, it's livable given the level of GDP and inflation, real nominal GDP right now for people to begin to borrow at 6.88 mortgage for 30 years. Um, and so that's not tight. And so what I think is important isn't so much what they do on the front end. Um, but what happens on the back end. And so uh, that depends more so on what the Treasury does in terms of the composition of its debt and what the Fed does simply in terms of the short rate, the best thing they can do, well, in terms of the short rate, the best thing they can do is keep it high because that'll make the long rate less attractive. Um, but at the same time, 
what they really can do is not taper quantitative tightening, not take off any of the pressure on the long end of the yield curve. Um, but they are talking about tapering. So we'll have to see what happens in May. I expect them to announce either a specific plan that starts in June or a reason why not, given the rhetoric they've put so far out so far, which has been their goal is to get reserves down by, say, a trillion dollars, and they can do it by running off $950 billion in a year, or they can do it by running off $950 billion in 18 months. And the difference is a taper. Um, and so that's what I'm looking at. The short rate, you know, pick them. Um, the market wants, animal spirits want the short rate to come in um, for whatever reason. Um, the real rate, the, the sort of myopic, what is the real restrictive short rate, the R star plus in, the inflation target that they uh, believe they should have and what level of tightness relative to that they should have are all relevant things and something the Fed seems to be myopically focused on. While what I think has driven the economy, its peaks and valleys over the course of the last few years, is the yields on long-term bonds. So given that, do you, do you think there was a case to be made that at the beginning of this, the Fed should have done more QT and maybe less increases on the short end? Like, would that have been more impactful? That's what I was saying then. Um, I was hoping they would actually make outright, do outright sales of mortgages. Um, you know, they had talked a big game about a desire to have no mortgages on their balance sheet in the future. And they set a relative, an okay target of $35 billion of runoff per year, per month. But they weren't able to achieve that because rates rose so quickly. They rose, drove rates up so quickly that all these mortgages stopped being refinanced. And so mortgage runoff has been running, you know, on average a little less than 20 a month. And that's nowhere near what they wanted. So I would have had them sell mortgages um, and, and some treasuries. But instead, what they did is they said, we're going to run off. And they literally handed the monetary policy lever of QT to the Treasury. And Treasury has, for a variety of very good and reasons, has uh, in certain periods of time been forced to mute Q QT and in other times enhance QT. And um, that has given, you, given QT a relatively mild influence because that you can see by what are very negative, what, close to zero term premiums on long-term bonds, and a very inverted yield curve. You can see short rates are much higher than long rates. Um, and so it hasn't really worked very well, but that would have been my view, still is my view, that if you want to kill inflation, the best way to do it is um, increase yields at the place where people actually borrow. Can you talk a little bit more about that treasury point you made? Because this is something I learned from you a while back, this idea that Janet Yellen may have more power here than the Fed actually does in terms of how she's setting issuance. So can you talk about that a little bit and how impactful that is? Sure. So what happens when the Fed um, does QT and the way they've decided to do it, the Bank of England actually makes outright sales of bonds. And so they have control. When the Fed does it, they let bonds mature. And so, okay, so the bond is mature. Now somebody has to pay them back. And that is the U.S. Treasury has to pay them back, as they would any investor whose bond matured. And so to get that money, they have to issue, the Treasury has to issue some new obligation to some, not the Fed, some private sector buyer. And if they chose to issue, say, for instance, T-bills, well, there's a huge demand for T-bills. They're extremely low risk. Uh, there happened to have been also this excess savings in the form of the reverse repo program that is in where most money market funds have a significant port of, portion of their investment over the last few years. Um, and so they were happy to move out of the RRP and into T-bills. And so that doesn't have any tightening effect on the market. It's just one short-term interest rate exchanged for another, and the Fed gets its money back. What does have an impact is if the Treasury, for instance, and this is obviously radical, if the Treasury said, we're going to every, we're going to issue an extra, you know, for QT at 60 billion per month, we're going to issue an extra 60 billion of 30-year bonds. 
Well, 30 year bonds are, you know, are uh, somewhat more risky than a T bill in that their price, you know, anyone who saw what happened in 2022 knows that a, the 30 year bond fell, I think it was over 35%. So when people buy a 30 year bond, they think of it very differently than buying a T bill. And so they have to make room for it in their portfolio on a risk adjusted basis. And so by selling 30 years, if Janet had chosen to do that, that would have been an extreme tightening. So now she doesn't do either of those things. She sells some bills and she sells so, some coupons. But the more bills she sells, the less tightening. And by and large, through the debt, once the debt ceiling came into place in um, December of 2022, 22. Yeah. Um, she mute, she basically reduced coupon issuance so significantly that uh, because of the debt ceiling, um, that at one point, uh, I believe it was the second quarter, she only issued $178 billion of net new coupons, which is the lowest post COVID. Um, and so markets loved that there was no bonds for sale. So they bought stock, they bought meme stocks, they bought crypto, et cetera. Um, and then in the third quarter, she announced that the fourth quarter was going to see a doubling of that supply of coupons. And as soon as that was announced, bonds started selling off, equity started selling off, and we fell, you know, 10% till, to Halloween. I think Russell's fell maybe 27%, if I remember correctly, in two and a half months. And then she blinked in October on Halloween and said, you know what, we're not going to increase coupons this time. And so it's very much her hand is on the tiller. Um, now she had good reason. She wasn't allowed to issue bonds when there was a debt ceiling. So the first two, two um, quarters of this year, she didn't have any capacity to issue. But the third quarter, when she decided to issue mostly bills to rebuild her checking account, the TGA it's called, um, that, oh, that was a significant easing and muting of QT, which only until only by the, you know, by the announcement of in, in August uh, reversed. So do you think as, as we move forward here, do you think she'll issue more duration? Do you think she'll wait till the election's over and then do it? Or how do you think that might play out? Well, on February 1st, yep, February 1st, she had her next increase and you know, it went from 178 billion in Q2 to 338 billion of net new coupons in Q3 to 348 billion in, um, sorry, in Q3 it was 178, in Q4 it was 338, in Q1 this year it was 348. But on in February she said we're going to issue 538 billion of net new coupons, which is by the way 1.1 trillion of gross coupons. And she said, and the TBAC, the Treasury uh, Borrowing Advisory Committee, and the members of the Treasury that are responsible for this wrote in their letter that they expected to keep that quantity of bonds on offer each quarter for many quarters to come. So it's a lot right now. Like it should be having a much bigger effect given that it's it's 4x or 3.5x uh, what it was um, just a year ago um, and is 200 billion more per quarter than it was in Q3 and Q, uh, Q4 and Q1. So it's a big slug of bonds that are being offered, and I do expect it to have a meaningful impact. Why it hasn't had much of an impact yet, I think, goes back to multiple times Janet has muted QT as a surprise. And so she's now discouraged people from front running her supply um, by these actions. And so I think we're going to just actually have to see sort of a, I've described it as a camel getting another piece of straw placed on its back until bond yields actually start moving in a meaningful way. And then you get the um, dynamic that can slow the economy enough to um, either land us softly or cause a recession. I'm curious, when you think about the election, like, do you think people overstate that? You hear that all the time right now. You hear like she's influenced by the election, then you hear the Fed who is independent. 
is influenced by the election and they're going to, you know, they're going to do things because the election's upcoming. I mean, do you think there's political influence in all that? Or, or do you think they're they're kind of just doing their job and they're they're outside of that? Well, I mean, there's the staff and then there's the uh, administ- uh, the um, elected officials that are responsible for the Treasury. And let, let's be clear about this. The elected officials are trying to get reelected. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Let's not buy, be naive. Now, the question becomes, what levers do they have and what do they actually want? So I'd be open to hearing what... Um, would be the best outcome for, I think I could, well, let me describe what I think would be the best outcome for the uh, current administration. I believe what would be best is for gasoline prices to be $3 at the pump, for uh, food prices to be back to where they were, or at least not going up anymore at all, home prices being more affordable, mortgage rates being lower, and um, what else? Uh, oh, and everybody having jobs. And that's what they'd want. Now, now you can, those, some of those things don't go together. And so the question becomes, what do you think they want? Like, which one's more important? Is inflation more important? Well, one might say that the gas pump is a pretty important uh, place for a majority of voters, a gross, gross majority of voters. And the financial asset market is uh, not necessarily their constituency. I'm not sure it's anyone's constituency, but it's certainly not the Democrats' historical constituency. So you, that brings us to jobs. And so now it's a question of would they sacrifice jobs, given how many jobs have been created and how tight the labor market is, um, for lower prices at the pump? or lower consumer goods prices, or lower cost of a haircut, or a nice meal, um, or even a crappy meal at, um, at a, uh, you know, a fast casual restaurant, which has gotten silly inflated. What would they want? And honestly, I don't know. I wish I did know, but they're not making it obvious what they would want. And then the question is, what leverage do they have to make it happen? Now, let's just dig into that very cl- quickly, which is, The Secretary of the Treasury has the lever I described, which she can decide to issue more or less coupon bonds. She has stated that she intends to issue the same amount this next quarter as she issued in in Q3 as she's issuing in Q2. Uh, We'll see. She'll tell us on May 1st. So I'm going to pay attention to that when she tells us. The other thing she can do, and this is a, uh, a discussion for another time, but I will tee it up. Um, There's this thing called the Treasury General account, which currently has $750 billion of money in it. And that's the money that the, that what happens is when we pay our taxes, that goes into that account. When uh, we um, buy a bond from the Treasury, that goes into that account. And what comes out of that account is the expenditures that the Treasury makes in the, to the real economy, both interest and spending interest being an increasingly large portion of that $7 trillion number. Um, and um, tax refunds and maturity payoffs. And so why is it $750 billion? Well, it turns out there's a really good reason why it's that large. And the reason is, is back on September 11th in 2001, um, for five or six days, uh, markets were completely closed, like, and that meant that the treasury could not issue anything, no bills, no nothing. And so they decided to implement a policy that is on the treasury's website regarding, you know, keeping money in the bank just in case they can't issue bills to create new funding. And that number is five days worth of net expenditures plus redemptions of existing bonds and bills. They don't want to go bankrupt. They don't want to not honor their maturing obligations. They expect to collect taxes and they expect to spend their expenditures, but it assumes they are not able to raise new money. And so that's a number that tends to run somewhere between seven or 50 billion and a little bit more over the course of the next 12 months. And so to take it below that amount would be risking 
a potential uh, market disruption event where they would not be able to meet their obligations. And so it's a pretty, it's a pretty meaningful standard. At the same time, they could, cons they have many times said, well, we're in a debt ceiling, so we can't raise new money. So we have to spend down the money. And so last year, we, all we were talking about is when was the X date? When was the government going to run out of money and shut down? Well, the running out of money is taking that Treasury General account, spending it um, down to zero. And so they came close to that. And the Treasury General account uh, has been rebuilt. Now, remember, they only took the risk of the September 11th market disruption event because there was a debt ceiling. They didn't do it voluntarily. They just said, hey, we, we, don't ha we have a debt ceiling. We have, to we have to meet our obligations. So they spent their savings, their Treasury General account. Um, and so that's a dangerous thing to do. But conceptually, that if Janet wanted to reduce the amount of issuance in the economy while still spending, which would tend to be a thing that would inject money into the financial, into the real economy without demanding that money being invested in um, government obligations, that tends to be stimulative of financial assets. And so they could spend down the TGA, take that risk as a political maneuver to uh, goose, the econ goose the stock market and the bond market. Not necessarily the economy, and it's, it could may or may not be inflationary. So, and it may not or may or may not save anyone any jobs, but they could do that. So that's one lever. Now, there's an interesting dynamic um, based on the um, the um, financial fiscal responsibility act, which was the thing that resolved the debt ceiling. That there are some interpretations, and this is again for July. They'll tell us in July. Um, that says that the government has to spend down the TGA by January 2nd to the level it was on June 2nd of 2023. If they were to do that, the, the Treasury is going to say, yeah, we're going to follow the letter of the law and spend that money. <laughs> and they may get the outcome that they want, which is a pumped up equity market. Or they're going to say, well, the way we interpret the law, and the law isn't clear, the way we interpret Clause 2B is that we're supposed to keep a normal amount of money in our TGA. In that case, we're not going to spend it down. So it's an interesting dynamic, one worth very, that one should follow very carefully, understand the whys and the, the hows. But that's the real lever that Janet has. But again, it's a financial market juicing. It's not an inflation fighting. In fact, it's arguably inflation causing. And it's not a job saver because it doesn't change the amount of real spending that the government does. It's interesting when you were answering that, I was just thinking about like, we're in a new world of trade-offs now, like in past elections in past years, when we had no inflation, if the government wanted to, you know, if they wanted to get reelected and if the Fed wanted to help them and if all that wanted to happen, it was more clear what they should do. Um, now, now it's a little less clear what they should do, right? Because they're going to, they potentially could have inflationary consequences of doing the things they could do before. Yeah, I, I honestly, well, you know, it's funny. It's I, 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 I don't have a political uh, view generally. I vote my conscious and who vote who I vote for. But um, it is interesting that not only that, we also have to focus on how maybe four or five states, and maybe within those four or five states, two or three counties in each of those states, and so that's who you're planning for. If you're pulling on levers, if you're manipulating. Now, the, the, the media will manipulate as well, but if you're pulling on those levers, you're really only targeting 11 counties on, in the United States to win your election because all the other counties are either blue or red, and there's nothing you're going to do that's going to change that. So, I, I, so what I basically say is uh, they're going to tell us certain things they're going to do. We don't know what that is. Let's assume that politics is going to be playing a role. But until you can tell me how they win those 11 counties with their actions, I'm going to say, I'm just going to wait and watch. And if they do something crazy like spend down the TGA or shift out of coupons into bills again, I know what I'll do. 
and you have time to get in position when they do it. I want to ask you about long-term structural inflation, because before all this happened, you, know, you, you sort of had three deflationary forces everybody was talking about. They were talking about technology, demographics, and globalization. And those are the things that kept inflation very, very low for a long time. And I'm just wondering about how you think about those going forward. I mean, I, I would think globalization may be shifting in the other direction, but then people say with, with AI, technology is going to be even more deflationary than it has been. Like, how do you think about long-term structural inflation in the context of those things? I think about it at some level, as it relates to what I do for a living, I think about it as a fairly well-informed person, but really as useful to me as any other cocktail party chatter. Um, it doesn't really have any impact on how I think of markets in the next year. So for instance, you mentioned AI as a deflationary force, and I agree it has great potential for um, increased productivity. Um, it does have a, and it has a second order impact. Not only will we be able to create more goods and services cheaper, but we'll also be able to fire a lot of people and their demand for goods and services will come down. And so spending on goods and services will come down unless that income that is lost by these people getting fired is made up for by some government spending. Um, like a UBI or something like that. Um, and so it could be extremely deflationary if both the demand side because of the fired workers and the supply side because of the greater quantity able to be of goods and services able to be produced could be extremely deflationary. But who cares? Today, nothing but spending is happening. There is Except for the chip sellers and some of maybe the rack sellers or, you know, some, the cooling tower sellers or anything that makes the picks and shovels of AI, um, no one's make a penny on this stuff. No one's seeing the benefit of, no one has turned their operation. No one has fired a single worker because of AI. No one is seeing increased manufacturing capacity because of AI yet. And so what I look at it is it's wildly inflationary at the, in the, in the near term and in the longer term, like the inflation reduction act, the ironically named inflation and reduction act was a spending bill today to get the benefits of deflationary investment in the future. I don't know when that's coming around, but right now I know what is happening and you're getting inflation from these efforts. And that applies broadly speaking to most things, including the things you mentioned, like onshoring. Um, and, uh, you know, even if not onshoring, bringing our creating duplicate supply chains with p partners that are m more aligned with us, uh, you know, um, geopolitically or simply closer. Um, versus importing from China. And so those to me are meaningful structural inflation at the same, at the moment and are deflationary over time. And I just not going to hold my breath. I guess we should call this segment before I switch back to uh, Justin here, that my last two questions, maybe should Jack be worried about these things? Um, because there, there's two things you've been seeing people very concerned about on Twitter. Um, and I want to ask you about each one individually and see what your level of concern is. And and the first one is this idea that, you know, the national debt is, is very high right now. And, you know, many people see a situation that could spiral out of control. You know, they see all kinds of, you know, second order effects to that. How, how worried are you about the level of the national debt right now? Uh, not very much at all. Um, the level of debt is, um, is uh, high, no doubt about it. The uh, interest payments are high, but also not significant relative to GDP yet. Um, and it appears that we are, uh, the deficits, which is the important thing. That's what creates additional debt. The deficits are, um, not likely to go up in the near term. Now I am worried in a recession, if we were to have a recession, what would happen to the deficits as the government typically in a recession counteracts uh, declining private sector incomes with public sector spending. So I am concerned about austerity in a recession causing a bigger problem. Um, 
But, you know, I have faith in our politicians to act in exactly the way they always act, which is bipartisan deficit increasing. They both always spend more than they take in. There is, and that politically, it's a pie splitting thing where one party may um, tax less and another party may spend more, but both are deficit creating. So I have confidence there's going to be deficits. The question, are they going to escalate instead of staying high? And if they stay at, you know, 1.4, 1.5 trillion for a while, eventually our debt is going to get to a tipping point. Um, but it's nowhere near where a tipping point today. Just in this, as an aside, do you ever think we'll return to like what we saw in 2019, you know, 0% Fed's rate, Fed funds rate, um, 3% mortgages? Do you think that's something we see again in our lifetime or do you, do you think that's over? I would like to say it's over, but I would never say never. I think that um, experiment uh, by and large failed. And what I mean by that is if you look at the 2010 through 2019 timeframe, we got very little asset inflation and pretty subpar growth, certainly subpar uh, in GDP, nominal GDP. Um, and so it didn't really do the um, sort of stimulative thing that you would have you would have hoped for. And that's precisely because the government, you know, every I, I watched um, Greenspan, Bernanke and Yellen and then Powell, um, go up to the hill and say, we're doing our part. You need to do yours or else we're going to have subpar growth. And they never, never, never really did except all at once in 2010, 20 and 2021, then they got with the picture. And so I think that my prior, um, firm, one of my prior firms that I worked um, for calls it MP3, which is monetary policy three. And it's not MMT per se, mon um, that is a popular version, but it's not dissimilar in that I think that, that the response to a significant slowdown, significant, meaningful slowdown, you know, like a 3000 S and P and a negative 2% growth for six months will be something like that instead of single-handed action by the, the Fed to lower rates to zero and to be do, doing QE, because that doesn't work. They need spending. And so that's what I think the first try will be. First, there's going to be in a recession. First, the first action is always austerity. The second, if it's a slow grinding recession, if it's a sudden one like 2000, something breaks, um, you can see um, the fiscal side act quickly, but by and large, there's austerity, and then it's followed by spending. And if that spending is essentially financed by QE at positive interest rates, I think that's a more likely outcome than a, you know, the Fed trying to lift the economy all on its own because it created a lot of bad behaviors and it created a lot of... Um, of unsustainable conditions that we're still living with. The last thing I want to ask you before I hand it back to Justin is this idea of the refinancing wall. So a lot of people have this idea that a lot of the court, there's a lot of corporate debt that has to be refinanced. It hasn't been refinanced yet. You know, so we haven't seen the impact of these rates. And when, when it comes, we've got a coming catastrophe. Like, what do you think about that? Uh, so credit spreads are extremely tight and interest rates are very low and everybody knows that. And so there is not a single treasurer or CFO on the planet who is not looking at their maturity wall and addressing it. They have deep liquidity, they have low credit spreads, and they have higher interest rates, but they could hedge them if they want, if they want to make that bet. But they also have high nominal GDP. So by and large, that thing, that tends to work itself out. Now, the commercial real estate market is probably one narrow section of that. And within commercial real estate, it's certain subsections of that. I don't want to get into the weeds on that, but I assume there's going to be some difficulty in some of those, for those, some of those banking institutions that have made those loans. And certainly for the equity holders that own the equity in those properties. 
we uh, wanted to sort of talk about how some of these ideas manifest themselves in actual portfolios and strategies. Um, but before sort of maybe we get into that a little bit, just can you explain how you sort of differentiate alpha and beta um, and how you would define those things? Because, because on your, you know, as part of what you offer our subscribers is these alpha and beta portfolios, which maybe we'll talk about in a few minutes, but you know, how would you explain this to investors in your, your way of defining alpha and beta? Yeah. So I think that, um, one of the only places where investors have essentially free money is by buying securities that allow a real economy participant, whether it's a corporation, a mortgagee, or a government to spend in the real economy, to buy a factory, to buy a home, or to provide, to buy a, a aircraft carrier. Um, and so when those seekers of money offer their securities as, um, as, uh, as payment for the money, um, they offer a positive expected return through time. And that positive or expected return is often called the risk premium. That's what I like to call it. And it's basically saying that if a somebody, a somebody is a saver, somebody has cash and they're willing to lend it, um, that, um, it's not dissimilar for you and I playing a game of dice, you walking up to me and saying, do you want to bet, uh, a uh, hundred dollars on a coin flip? And I'm going to say, and you're very motivated to do this for whatever reason. And I'm going to say, uh, no, that has zero expected value to me. Why would I take on risk? For no reason. And then you say, well, I'll pay you 101 uh, and you only have to pay me 100. And I'm going to say, okay, well, that has a positive 50 cent expected value to me. I'll do that or I won't do that. Um, financial assets have that characteristic of the uh, a motivated seller, a corporation, a mortgagee, or the government wanting your money to spend in the real economy. And you sitting back and choosing amongst all the possible places to invest, including holding cash, all of which have some risk. And you assess that and say, yeah, I'll do it. And so what I think happens is that through time, it's been shown that um, if you hold cash, reinvest it overnight for 5, 10, 15, 25 years, a century, compared to owning a diversified asset portfolio, you'll find that you earn excess returns in owning assets. That's what I call beta. That's free money that all you have to do is buy and hold. And you should earn excess returns versus cash. And so I think beta is, you know, the greatest thing in the world and everyone should own, most have, should have most of their assets in that type of strategy. Now, um, what type of portfolio? It should be balanced. I happen to like portfolios like uh, um, AQR's Risk Parity. Um, the um, there's ETFs that are um, called Alpar, for instance, that has a portfolio I like, and Bridgewater's All Weather portfolio. I have a portfolio that's similar to those things, and that it probably has more gold, more commodities, and more. Uh, bonds than most people's portfolio, but it still has plenty of equity. And I like that because it tends to work better in a broader range of possible outcomes, particularly ones like we've seen lately. Um, and so I like that. But any portfolio is fine. Most portfolios, even 60 40 is not awful. They're going to earn a positive return on cash through uh, if you hold them long enough. And so again, for your listeners, that's what I'd have you in. Then down a level, there's this game of outperformance that people do. You give a investor money and they outperform something, a benchmark. So the long only active manager typically might be benchmarked against the S&P 500 to put it simply. 
And that active manager is supposed to beat the S&P 500. The return of the S&P 500 is all beta. The outperformance or underperformance is alpha. And how do you generate outperformance? Well, if the world is invested in all the assets on the planet, which they are, you have to take it from somebody else. To get outperformance, you have to be smarter than somebody else. You have to pick better stocks. Well, if you pick these better stocks, that means somebody else had to sell those better stocks and buy worse stocks. Because as I said, every stock is owned. So you're buying them from somebody who thinks they're good stocks and selling, and they're then buying. And so that whole thing works in a way that it's zero sum. And so I think of alpha as the zero sum way of timing the market so that you're buying something that is um, going to outperform what you're selling. Um, and that's alpha. Now that alpha can be expressed in many, many different ways. Uh, it can be a, um, it can be macro like what I do, which is changing, you know, I, I go long and short assets and because I go long and short assets equally, and I don't particularly care whether I'm long or short in av on average, I have, I'm neutral. Um, and because I do that, my benchmark is cash. And that's okay. A cash benchmark's no big deal because as I said, most of my wealth is in long only beta. So I get the market return and my alpha just gives me extra money versus cash. Um, and so that's how I think about investing. And I think that the question then becomes, um, do you have alpha as an investor or if you're, pa if you're giving your money to somebody else to invest, who is trying to outperform, do they have alpha? And those are hard questions to answer. You had mentioned in the, uh, the beta portfolio that you own probably more gold than, you know, some other strategies, but that's been, I would imagine that's been good because gold's kind of woken up here lately. Right. <laughs> You know, gold actually is an interesting asset. It really hasn't done very well um, when measured against most things. Certainly, mm. you know, if you bought gold at 800 in the, when it first became legal to own gold in America in the 1970s, you made awful returns. Um, and so it's really important when you buy it. Um, if you bought it recently, that's good. You did well. But that's alpha, not beta. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I like gold because it offers properties that nothing else does, which is the potential for monetary infl to hedge monetary inflation. Now, Bitcoin may do the same thing or crypto may do so the same thing. Broadly speaking, I think other assets do the same thing, broadly speaking. So real assets. So gold is interesting and it's like money. And, um, you know, I think it's, it should be in someone's portfolio. Are, are you considering uh, any crypto assets for the beta side? I like to do things I understand fully, and I feel like everyone else has much more edge than I do in crypto. Um, I also think that it's volatility. You know, when I was really liking crypto, there was a period of time, and it's gone up, that doesn't matter. Um, there was a period of time in which it, I guess it was probably about six months ago when it was just stuck at 30,000. It might have gone to 26 and then up to 30 and then down to 26. And it was just stuck. And I was like, yes, the speculative pump and dump nature of that asset had sort of retreated. And it actually became, instead of correlated to meme stocks or QQQs, it became correlated to gold. I'd like to buy crypto when it's like that. and. The question is, is there alpha between today when it's not like that and one day when it is like that? There may be. I just am going to miss it because I'm not going to be able to understand it. Can you just, I want to go back to the island thing for a minute and the fact that you, you know, you left the island and you're, you're sort of going to, you know, some island. But just let's talk about decision making for a minute because, you know, how do you just walk through like, uh, 
an example or how you think about changing your mind on something or not. You know, we were we, we did a podcast the other day and we were talking about Daniel Kahneman and all of his contributions to behavioral economics and decision making. And, you know, there's this idea of the sunk cost fallacy. Um, and, you know, and, and we gave an example of Jason Zweig wrote an article about him. And it was an article about how they sat down one day, him and Kahneman, and wrote this big, long article. And then the next morning, Jason woke up and the article was completely different. Like he had rewritten the whole thing. And J Jason was like, how could you do that? And he's like, I have no sunk costs. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I would, I would imagine, you know, as someone that's been investing uh, using these macro strategies for as long as you have, you know, you, you might have a, a somewhat similar principle, but just kind of talk, talk about that decision-making process and how you think about that. Yeah. Number one, I'm far from perfect. Number two, um, I've seen the way people tend to, um, go about that. And, um, that is either discretionarily, which is something in your head that you bring together, um, to create a signal, um, or systematically mm -hmm. in which you get a machine to do that for you. Um, I'm a single person operator. I have as many things as I systemize, as I could systemize, systemized. Um, I would like to systemize everything I do and I don't have the resources to do. That. So I have to make compromises. And part of that is being discretionary. I saw the a discretionary macro firm of, you know, of the top quality when I worked at Brevin Howard. And I saw um, Bridgewater do systematic trading. And throughout my Wall Street career, both as a hedge fund manager and as a, bro as a broker dealer at Solomon Brothers, a derivatives professional at Solomon Brothers, um, I tried to systemize everything. And so I continue to favor that, to deal with the sunk costs um, that you describe. Um, and, uh, but then the other thing is um, just constantly um, exploring where I could be wrong, like spending way, way more time on how I could be wrong than how I could be right. So uh, final sort of question here. Um, when you are looking out over the next 12, 18 months, what are the things that you're most worried about? And what are the things that you're most optimistic about? I think the thing I'm most worried about, I'll be blunt. I think the, um, the, the combination of the, uh, various forces that are, ex that are winds that are blowing across the economy and the geopolitical landscape that we could have a meaningful dislocation. Uh, and that could be social, it could be economic, it could be uh, markets, any, all of these things. So I do think there's some rough waters ahead in that regard. But in particular, the thing I'm most concerned about financial markets is that we, uh, that the, the, um, uh, that we don't kill inflation. That's the number one thing I think is most that most important for society right now is killing inflation. And I am, um, while I, um, am sympathetic and don't want to see anyone feel pain. I think the pain that the, the overall populace will feel, uh, even in a shallow recession is much, uh, versus what, uh, an individual class would feel in a, in a, or set of people will feel in a, in a, uh, um, a, a shallow recession. I'd take the um, pain of the recession over inflation. Um, so that's the number one thing. In terms of optimism, I think the experience I've had meeting guys like you two and meeting everybody out that I've met um, over the course of the last two years, the, the conversations I have, uh, the, the learning I'm doing is astounding. It's just astounding what a community of people that are looking to try to help each other and educate each other can do. And so when I think about all the great things that our society can do, that gives me the greatest optimism that we now have a way that you can connect with subject matter experts that generously offer their time and pay it forward in a way that pretty much everyone has access to. I think that's, that's so different than 20 years ago.
That's awesome. Thank you very much, Andy. We, uh, we really appreciate your time and we look forward to seeing you uh, in a couple of weeks here on the live stream. It's going to be fun. Thanks. This is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital.